Wake that ass up. LA's number one hip hop morning show is Nick Cannon Mornings on Power 106. Nick Cannon Radio, you know how we do. It is time for community conversation. And uh, I feel privileged right now to speak to uh, another fellow member of the media. And this brother is on the front lines in a real way. And we've all seen it. It came across our feeds as we were even watching CNN, where we watched um, a fellow member of the media, fellow member of the community get detained by law enforcement. And, and again, I didn't understand when I saw it. Hopefully we would get some more clarity on what actually went down. But it's an opportunity to speak uh openly and freely with my brother Omar Jimenez from uh, CNN, a CNN correspondent. How you doing, O? I'm all right, man. How you doing? Man, um, I'm I, honestly, man, we were just speaking off, off camera. It's, it's an interesting time. 2020 is a year like no other. And I think even in this whole ordeal, one of the things that will always be in my mind uh, was in the middle of coverage, watching what was going on during the civil unrest and protests, seeing you be arrested <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> as a member of the media, uh, at CNN correspondent being detained. First, let's just break that down. What actually happened in that moment? Yeah, so so we have been out there for days in Minneapolis covering the the unrest uh, after George Floyd's death, which we saw play out on that awful cell phone video under the officer or under the knee of that that police officer. And this was, I think, day four. We were out basically next to the third police precinct in Minneapolis that had been lit on fire uh, in one of the previous nights. And when we got there that early morning, basically that entire block was on fire. Right. And we were reporting there for maybe two hours and there was no no law enforcement, no firefighters, no nothing. And then all of a sudden, everybody showed up within five minutes. Police, firefighters, everyone got to the scene. Wow. And we were looking at this literal line of state police officers that were advancing up this block. And as we were sitting there, we kept doing our thing. They stood behind us for a while. They seemed like they were doing their thing. Then it seemed like this this woman or a protester or whoever ran past us, they started chasing that person. Next thing I know, we're surrounded, me and my my crew, my photographer, producer, and, and security. And then there were no words exchanged. The first words I heard were, you're under arrest. And I said, what? what? Say it again. <laughs> they said, you're under arrest. And I felt like, at least we skipped some steps. I feel like there should have been some communication. <laughs> right, you know? right, absolutely. Um, yeah. And the next thing I know, you know, we were we were in cuffs being led to the police van and, um, you know, everybody was watching it play out live on TV. It just so happened like a minute or so into our our report, literally live. And this was this broadcast was all over the world. The police did this and the camera was pointed right at it. I, I thank my photographer every day, Lionel Mendez, who kept that camera rolling right. so that the world could see exactly exactly what happened. So what happened to the officers? after clearly they wrongly arrested you i have no idea and really? actually the the state police there they never communicated with me directly as to why exactly we were uh we were cuffed they put out a statement on twitter right after saying that well the reason they were detained was we had to uh was we had to confirm they were members of the media but look I'll give them that for the first maybe 10 to 15 minutes. Even if you go after, even if you, it, let's forget the live TV, let's forget the cameras, forget my press ID, let's forget all that. Sure, I'll give it to you for 15 minutes. But we sat in that police van for a good 30, 35 minutes. You could have opened up Twitter, turned on any TV, Googled me, you had my information, and you would have been able to to confirm it right there. But then after that 35 minutes, we were then taken to the down to the um, basically like the public safety building in downtown Minneapolis. And we sat there for a long while. And so the whole thing took about an hour, 20 minutes, which was short in the grand scheme of things, but more than enough time to confirm that we were actually reporters and actually doing our job. So um, our team came out and corrected that statement very quickly. And the governor of Minnesota was really good about apologizing in his press conference and to me personally. But uh, but no, didn't hear anything from from state police. Wow. So then, I mean, that just 
truly shows the the greater issue here is law enforcement in itself um it's just mismanaged <laughs> in in the idea of you know people enforcing laws one that they probably don't even understand uh, you know these men and women are employees uh yeah. and there's an infrastructure there that gives them power that they misuse. I mean, that's why we were all out there in Minneapolis for the murder of George Floyd. And then even in that moment, and we've seen this amongst all of the civil unrest, that they are they continue to mismanage civilians. They continue to mismanage humans. Like I always say, like, yo, if this if these were a bunch of dogs <laughs> that were running the streets and people saw, you know, people putting dogs in choke holds or putting cuffs on dogs for no reason. The whole world <laughs> would <Yeah>. demand <laughs> those officers' heads uh, immediately. But the fact that they have the power with their badges and their guns to just do whatever they want and then don't have to have an explanation afterwards. Yeah. I mean, as a member of the media, someone who not only uh, documents and records history, uh, but also as a black man, how does that make you feel uh, your, in your position of, all right, I'm doing the right thing? And then two, like, does it matter, though? Yeah. Well, so th there are a lot of things that, you know, as you can imagine, there's there was the work mode of me, you know, trying to make sure that, that I'm doing everything the right way. But then there's also I mean, I'm still still a human still still american i got my rights and 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 you know it goes back to also conversations i've had with my family growing up growing up as a black kid in, in the united states where i mean you we've all had the talk when you get your driver's license about how to interact with police which yeah. came as a shock to a lot of my white friends that i've known even for 10 15 years right um we've all heard the talks about how to act around police officer interactions in general to be compliant, to make it out of that interaction. That is that is the goal. And then you deal with the stuff afterwards. Well, clearly in this instance, if you're using that lens, you we all saw. I mean, I thought I was being polite. I felt like everyone else was being polite. Yeah, I was right. saying, look, you're being I'm professional. You were doing your yeah. job. Yeah. And like in that moment, and let's also be honest, like there are many scenarios where where us as reporters and police do have to talk to each other just from a professional standpoint if they're doing their job i'll let them do their job over here i'll stay over here we'll talk so in that moment i felt like we still were in the sort of professional mindset of right. just tell me where you want me to go and we'll go about our days um but that didn't stop me from ending up in cuffs and right. i was fortunate enough that i had the power of cnn behind me I, I had the power of a live audience behind me that was demanding answers but the reality is 99.9% .9 of these types of interactions don't happen on camera. They right. happen off in some, in some alley or some neighborhood street where even if someone acted the exact same way as I did, all of a sudden the story is in question because now there's two different versions of events. Right. And, um, and so, you know, that, that's one of the main things I think about that. Again, I was fortunate in this to, to be an example to show what really happens but if they were willing to do this on camera, it makes you question what is actually happening uh, when things are off camera. And it's painful to see, I mean, because you make an outstanding point that the majority of the interactions with law enforcement aren't filmed. Uh, but the, the constant feed that we see daily of... I, I want to say all, all men and women of color specifically, uh, how they are patrolled in in this in this way of treating them as second class citizens and i yesterday i saw a video of a cop a, the kid was in cuffs and the cop just hit him in the face like just swung and punched him <laughs> and then and then obviously i mean you're from atlanta we we we've seen the the recent uh, events again uh, another man murdered on camera uh, uh, as a member of the media what do you think subconsciously this is doing to our children and this next generation that you know i'm a father uh, of three and having to explain to my kids you know who george floyd is or why there's black men hanging from trees and and you know why the police officers are bad people now i i never thought i would have to have that level of conversation 
with, you yeah. know, a, a third grader. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, so a few things, one, I mean, I, I think there is a lot of power in imagery, right. Where no matter, no matter how much you try to tell a kid, for example, you know, most police officers are good, but you know, there are some bad ones that, you know, you have to keep an eye out for or whatever that image of an officer with a knee on George Floyd's neck erases all of that. And that's, what's going to, that's, what's going to stay. Right. And so it's almost like that, you know, if you watch horror movies as a kid growing up, you're going to be scared of, of the boogeyman when you're older, you know, Indeed. it's kind of that same, that same mentality. Um, and so part of, I mean, there's, there's no way around it. it. It's in some ways it's, it's unfortunate because these are the people that again, are supposed to protect and serve our communities. But, but this is the reality of what's happening right now. The other side that I think about as well, because I do try to be an optimist as much as I can, um, even though things have been crazy, is that I think for the first time in at least a long time, people of all colors and, and all communities are, are seeing the reality of what's going on and people feel compelled to actually do something. I mean, right. I can't remember the last time we've seen marches in every city across the country every night, not just protesting for George Floyd, but about trying to have real reform in police departments. I truly can't remember another time where we've seen that. Maybe you have to go back to the 60s. Right. Um, so so the optimist in me is like, OK, you haven't had those tough conversations with your kids, the real conversations. People are seeing now what is being filmed and questioning what's not being filmed. And so hopefully we can grow as a society. And we're already seeing we're already seeing moves from police departments in Minneapolis and, uh, and in Baltimore and in New York City and other places to try and reform some of how police are funded. Um, that's my hope that things right. can get better. But I mean, that's that's all you can have at this point. Now, we're we're starting to see uh, quite a few government officials, as you put it, uh, use rhetoric like reimagining law enforcement, uh, community safety patrolling, even though I still don't like the word patrolling. But uh, my abolitionist mindset is Law enforcement, even just, you know, because when uh, policing, uh, uh, you know, modern American policing was created in the 1700s, um, the idea was to uphold the law and protect uh, the public. But now the word enforcement has been put in policing as in, you know, policing property. Um, Why do we have it? What in that idea of what law enforcement is? Can we have a society, in your opinion, without... Mm -hmm. A, a, someone coming into a community with a gun and a badge and, you know, controlling the area through fear. Is there another way? Are are we civilized enough to say we don't need someone with a gun over our shoulder telling us how to operate? Uh, do, is, is there a utopian aspect of where we can operate or at least, you know, in this idea because you know starting to be a partisan conversation of you know defunding the police or reimagining law enforcement or is it just like yo let's let's operate as humanity well so what you touched on is the exact is the exact passion that people have right now that when is enough enough when is what we have done so far proven to not work and so that's what everybody's looking at right now when it comes to for example let's just look at I've done a lot of stories dealing with 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 gun violence, um, particularly in black neighborhoods, either from my time in Chicago or I used to work as a local reporter in Baltimore. Right. And one of the things that you hear, no matter who you talk to, is that violence in those neighborhoods can't just be solved with policing. It comes down to a wholehearted uh, and a multifaceted approach, education, even down to things like having uh, grocery stores available. It comes from a whole holistic. Right. Approach. And so. And so when you talk about, oh, can we change as a society to where, you know, police are, have less of an influence in our communities? I, I think it's possible. Um, I think the tough thing is where that idealism meets sort of the reality of where we are. It's going to be a gradual process if right. it goes forward. Um, and I, I think it's tough. People like to fully invest in something that's sure that that they know will work. And the thing is, we don't have enough data to show that it will work. All we know or what we have seen is that we don't like what's happening right now. Right Um, now. And and then one other thing I'll I'll say as well. So on the on the defund the police movement, um, I mean, as 
as we all know, it's not about taking all the money away from the police department. It's about redirecting some of the funds that would have gone to police to other aspects of the community to make it stronger. Right. And one of the arguments I even heard from um, from a, a police officer family that, that I grew up with, who they, they have been some of the strong supporters of police that I've known throughout my life. They said they were actually in support of it because in her opinion, this was her, she was speaking of her husband, who was a police officer. She thought he was wearing too many hats mm. that she believed there are times where, you know, sometimes you need an aggressive response because there's something going on. But she said the majority of the time they're responding to calls where a mental health expert might be the, the person that is needed, right, where a counselor might be the person that's needed, where a medical professional, but we're giving that blanket sort of to police. So those are the conversations that at least I'm encouraged by, because I think what we have seen is that now it's not just, you know, people in the black community's opinion that policing and how it's working now is not working to its fullest. It seems to have extended beyond that. Um, and to get your to your point of, of could we get to a community to a society where there are no police and we're policing or you know we're we're looking out for each other in our community? Sure, um, but if we get there, it's going to take some time. Yeah, I, I have faith in humanity. I, I truly yeah. do. Uh, we are speaking with Omar Jimenez, and I'd be remiss to to ask you know. My brother, how are you <laughs> doing <laughs> like personally and all this? I mean, obviously, you know, yeah. you're you're a member of the media, so you're used to attention. But I feel like probably your level of attention, specifically in your your work field. I mean, at CNN are are, are things uh, in a in a healthy format. And even now, you know, you're you're. You're doing probably more interviews than you've probably done in the past. And even thinking about, you know, where you how you move now as a member of the media. Are you are you driven now to be more of an outspoken voice because of what has happened to you on camera or like wh wh where's your headspace at in all of this? Yeah. So so I'm in a good headspace for a few reasons. One, I feel like I got a good group of people around me, both professionally and on the friend side. We've had some good conversations about, you know, similar to this. It's about about what happened. Where do we go from here? Things like that. I also just got up a few days of vacation where I had to take just four days just to reset. You know, um, yeah. this was after George Floyd's funeral. It had been a, a pretty crazy uh, well, almost month leading up to that. Right. So that helped me reset a little bit. Um, and then also, I mean, look, the more conversation we have about this and the more you're able to to pair that up with with current events as we see them unfold daily for better or for worse. I think that's the only way that you can truly grow because growth is always difficult. We, we've known that for a while. Um, and so as far as as far as me feeling like I have any sort of added responsibility, I think I, I definitely do. And at the very least, that comes from, you know, the number of, of, of followers that, that increase increase on social media and now me realizing well if i'm going to say something i need to make sure i'm saying something that counts right and that comes down to to not just stories like this but um i'm a national correspondent for cnn so i i do all types of stories i mean i started the year covering kobe bryant which was right. the worst things i've ever covered right. covered wildfires i've covered this and so now moving forward um and based on some of the messages i've gotten there are people that that are looking up to me in some ways for the next generation. Yeah. And whether I like it or not, I, I, I carry that torch and I carry that weight. And that, that adds a little bit more weight and um, to what I do and trying to make sure I, I do it with purpose. Indeed. And your following has increased. Um, so with that, mm -hmm. and, and I, I, don't, I can't imagine if this is the case, but, have you received any negative responses or any backlash or any flack for now kind of stepping out and just kind of just being thrown on the front lines? I mean, you were there to to report and all of a sudden, you know, you are a fine example of how black men are treated in this country. You know, no questions asked. So I'm pretty sure because we, we know the, the opposing side could come hard. Have you experienced any of that? I actually, if I have, honestly, it's probably buried in there somewhere. I haven't gotten to all of it. I'm sure I'll get to it eventually. <laughs> but one of the um, one of the big things that actually we were really conscious of in the beginning, even even to get ahead of any backlash that would have come, was that obviously this was happening. My arrest happened in the middle of what was already a bigger story. 
with, right. with George Floyd. And so we were really, really careful. And I, I was helping lead this push in trying to keep the focus on the story right. as much as possible. I saw that I, and I commend that too. I saw that you didn't want to make it about you. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and even and the interesting part of, of what happened outside of all the emotional aspect of it um, for, for our arrest was that it was kind of like like a mini version of the story that we were covering. Right. So you could take it was symbolic almost of the story that we were covering. Um, and that made it a little easier to keep things tied into it, because one of the things I always talked about was was as crazy as this was for me, this was happening within a week of a family that was still trying to process the loss of a loved one, the loss of a, a father, an uncle, right. um, and, and more. And they're doing that on the biggest stage possible when the microscope of the world is on them. Right. And then here I am, whether I like it or not, adding this extra fuel to it. So we were really conscious of that. And of course, I mean, as you know, there are always people saying stuff on, on social media. I haven't gotten through all of it, but you know, I try to stay positive and for the most part, people have been supportive. Yeah, like you said, man, I mean, in all said and done, I'm pretty sure in years to come, there will be uh, a film documenting this process and, and your story will be a subplot in that film of even in the midst of it and, and, and trying to correct it in the amongst the civil unrest. It's another example of how, you know, a member of the community and a member of the media is, is mistreated. So in, in your honest opinion, yeah, where do we go from here? Like in in a real yeah. way, like not in a not in a political way, or not like hopefully yeah, yeah. we can all get it going. Like even as we move forward in twenty twenty, like you said, it's one of the craziest years I've ever experienced. Yeah, where do we go from here? So where we go is you have to have a concrete policy change. So whether that comes from holding police officers accountable, whether that comes from concretely defunding the police in some way to redirect funds, it, it has to do that. Because look, I, I've covered protests over the course of even my short career. I told you I was local in Baltimore. I covered the aftermath of what happened with Freddie Gray there. I've had my colleagues covering things like this from, from Ferguson, even back to, to Florida with Trayvon Martin. And so what, what has happened, whether we like it or not, is it's become this cycle, right? right. Where we're shocked by what happens, the media converges for the breaking news. Maybe there's a trial of the person, they get acquitted, and then this person just becomes another hashtag that then gets added to the next person this happens to. Right. And so where we go from here is we we had hoped George Floyd would be the last one, but then just a few days, you know, yeah. two weeks later, we have Rayshard Brooks in, in Atlanta. Right. And and what what needs to happen is that these can't be more hashtags there has to be i think we have seen that what is happening now isn't quite working so right. show us a policy put in place that policy and even if you're not sure if it'll work let's see if it works because that's that's what we need right now so for example i've been encouraged with what i've seen in minneapolis to where the city council voted to almost immediately ban chokeholds and and increase accountability for officers to where they decrease penalties if you if you told another officer for doing something they thought was wrong. I thought that was amazing that that happened within days of this happening or within two weeks or so, because that's the quickest I've ever seen anybody move on any policy thing. Instead, they were getting trapped in that cycle before. So where do we go from here? We need a policy to back up the rhetoric of the protests and the stuff that we've seen across the country. Man, well, it's been an honor and a pleasure speaking with you. Uh, thank you for breaking down yeah, the man. entire story. I mean, I still don't understand on, on the law enforcement side. <laughs> and it sounds like you're still kind of in the dark yeah, on that. Is yeah. what, hey, like you, why you were arrested in the first place. <laughs> uh, but we're, we're happy you're safe, man. And we're, we're happy that the world got an opportunity to see how it, it doesn't even matter if you ha have a camera rolling or not. Um, you are instantly judged by by law enforcement based off of your appearance, and yeah. man, it's it it was a powerful statement. And you know, you, you did your job profoundly as a journalist. So <laughs> uh, we we appreciate you, my brother. CNN correspondent Omar Jimenez. Man, keep it going out there. Of course, man. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Anytime, love.